so today we're going to talk about the ovaries and adnexa, um, covering some common presentations and the initial management of them. So we're, I'm going to go through a little bit of basic anatomy because I think it's important to understand some of the concepts and how people will present. You just need to have a, an overview of the anatomy. It doesn't need to be super detailed. We're going to correlate um, that to the scan images. So what's the anatomy that we're looking at? What's the problem? How does that relate to the scan pictures? And then how do those scan images relate to what we're actually seeing um, if and when we need to undergo laparoscopic and surgery uh, for these cases so that we can um, put everything together and get a really a, a really deep understanding of what's going on. And then I'll talk a little bit about how we manage them, mostly in the acute setting. So I'm not going to go into lots of detail, but I'll cover the sort of initial steps and things that um, I would expect us to do in the acute setting. So I've used for the reference materials, the um, anatomy have, has come from a book called Reproductive Anatomy. It's got some really um, quite detailed and quite nice images, which I've reproduced here. The ultrasound, um, some of them are from the Atlas of Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynaecology. If you're a Royal College member, you've got access to this um, through the college. And then some of them are real life patients with um, personal images reproduced with permission. And again, the laparoscopic images, uh, they've got various sources as stated. Some of them are images of uh, patients that I've treated with, again, with consent and permissions. And others are from um, other sources which I've specified. The clinical guidance is from various different places. So the Royal College guidelines uh, for management of pre and postmenopausal cysts. There's quite a lot of detailed information on the Royal College e-learning um, and anybody that has their e-portfolio account and pays their fees will have access to those e-learning modules. And then the endometriosis management comes from the um, ESHRA guidelines. And there are some really useful TOGs. So these are um, the obstetrician gynaecologist and it's a, a sort of day to day um, management of conditions that uh, I've borrowed heavily from on management of tube ovarian abscess and, and torsion. And I think these are two really good articles. If you don't have access, I'd be um, more than happy to um, share those with you. So a little bit of anatomy um, or quite a lot of anatomy on this picture. So you've got the uterus there in the middle. So this is you're looking um, as if the patient is facing you. So you've got the uterus in the middle um, here. You've got the, the cervix and the vagina. Coming out to the side, you've got the um, sometimes called the suspensory ligament or the uterovarian ligament, the ovary here. And they're just showing you some various stages of follicle development. But we'll talk a bit more about that later. And then you've got the fallopian tube which is coming and meeting the uterus here and is just sitting adjacent to the ovary. They're all covered in the um, broad ligament, which is this sheet of very, very thin double fold of, um, of peritoneum. And you'll see that in more detail when we cover some surgical images. Um, the rest of it's there, but I don't, wouldn't get too worried about it just at the moment. So laterally, it's quite useful to understand a lateral view because when you scan, um, the ultrasound will be done in, in various different planes. So some of the images that will show will actually be in a lateral view. Um, I've got a talk specifically um, on the website about understanding ultrasound images and ultrasound reports, if that's something that you wanted to know a bit more about. But broadly, it's just worth remembering that the vagina goes upwards and backwards towards the patient's back. The uterus can be in various positions. So this uterus is anteverted. The fundus is pointing forwards. And they can be axial where they point directly upwards or retroverted where they point backwards, but worth just having that understanding. So the laparoscopic view, so you're looking now, I don't know how many of you've managed to be or observe any laparoscopic surgery, but this is a camera that's been inserted at the umbilicus. The abdomen's been distended with gas, so normally these structures would all be touching each other, but the abdomen's been filled up um, with carbon dioxide. And then here your patient is lying on their back and you're looking down towards the patient's feet from the umbilicus. So you can see here you've got the uterus in the middle. You've got the fallopian tube coming down the side. This is the suspensory ligament with the ovary. This is the round ligament which supports the uterus. And then you've got various bowel and omentum at the back there. And this, this sort of area here is called the pouch of Douglas. <laughs> 
So specifically on the left side now, just to cover that in a little bit more detail. So you can see here I've annotated the diagram with lots of bright colours. So you've got the broad ligament and this is a ligament that supports the uterus. Just below that, this is the fallopian tube. You can't see the fimbrial end because it's buried underneath the bowel here. You've got the ovary, which is much more obvious because it's that white tissue. And then the pouch of Douglas, this potential space here right at the back. So coming on to the ovarian structure itself. So this would be somebody who's pre-menopausal that's still ovulating. And you'll see these represented on, on scan images. So you have early follicles, they get bigger, they develop, they become tertiary follicles, then they rupture and that happens every month. So they're um, ovulating there. Once that egg's been released, the um, that cyst sort of then changes into a, what we call a corpus luteum. Um, if they're not pregnant, that corpus luteum will regress. If they are pregnant, then that corpus luteum will persist and it will have a really good going blood supply and it will release um, lots of hormones to support the pregnancy. And these structures are visible, you know, macroscopically on, on ultrasound. So here we've got an ultrasound of a normal um, premenopausal ovary. So you can see it's this grey area here marked out by the markers. You've got just here, this will be a, a corpus luteum or a follicle. It's difficult to tell, it's in slight shadow there. And then you can see these much smaller follicles that are um, developing here. So these will be to ovulate in the next coming months. And postmenopausal ovary, you can see it's much smaller, more difficult to see, um, doesn't have those nice clear obvious follicles within it and that's because it's not as um, active so there's less blood supply and it's not undergoing ovulatory changes. So here we've got a normal ovary and a normal tube so you can see here um, this has been lifted up so that you can see it otherwise they, they hang down so you can see a nice smooth normal size ovary. Here you've got the tube which we've lifted up and that's the, the fimbrial end just hanging below. It's not dilated, it's not tortuous, it's not swollen, just nice, normal, healthy looking uh, tube and ovary. So the corpus luteum I touched on briefly earlier. So this is um, evidence of ovulation. It doesn't need any management. It's not pathological. It's just a physiological process. They can cause pain um, and that has the slightly wonderful name of uh, Mittelschmerz, which just means middle pain. The corpus luteum, the, those follicles undergo rupture and that can cause pain. So it usually happens around day 20 to 26. Um, and it's more common on the right, interestingly. So the right ovary um, ovulates about two thirds of the time and then the left ovary about one third of the time. So the corpus luteum can either look cystic. So in this picture, you can see it's clearly cystic. There's this nice black area in the middle and the tissue around the outside, or it can be hemorrhagic where it's not cystic anymore because there's a blood or a clot formed within the corpus luteum and these are both they're completely common they're not pathological they don't need any any management um, if someone's having recurrent mittelschmerz or painful ovulation you could consider giving them the something to suppress their ovulation something like the combined or contraceptive pill so here's a really nice picture of a corpus luteum so you can see um, this is the uterus here. We're lifting up the ovary just to flip it out so that you can see clearly. So this whiter area is the normal ovarian tissue. And then here is the corpus luteum. So you can see it's pinker. It's got a better blood supply. It's, it's exophytic. It's pointing out away from the ovary. And you can see this sort of area. And that's where the, the rupture has occurred for it to release that egg. So that's a normal um, post ovulation corpus luteum. So moving on now to some pathology, so moving away from what we would normally expect to see. This is an image of just a very simple ovarian cyst. So they're called simple cysts because they're, they're round, they're smooth, there's nothing within them, they're just black, so they just contain fluid. And this one you can see here is quite large, it's about um, eight, eight centimetres by six by six and a half. And this is exactly the same cyst shown at surgery so we've already removed the the left uh, left salping oophorectomy has already been performed but you can see there that's the ovarian cyst so you've got this this normal ovarian tissue that's all stretched out um you've got the cyst here and this is the the tube so the fimbrial tube has been sort of stretched out and splayed over the cyst it looks benign you can see it looks round it doesn't look like there's anything nasty going on it's just uh, what we would term a simple cyst so then you can have a, a septated cyst. So I don't know if you can see here, you've got the, the right ovary there. You've got 
this line and it almost looks like this cyst is divided into two and that's exactly what a septum means so it's almost like the cyst is in two pockets or two locules sometimes they're called so this is a septated cyst um it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be abnormal in any way it's just that it's got two little pockets so you can see um, this is exactly the same cyst on ultrasound. So you can see this is the right ovary that we could, if I go back, you can see in scan here, normal right ovary separate to the cyst. And then here you've got a normal ovary, which is separate. And then this ovary is enlarged with the cyst and it's got this other septated part attached to it. So on this view, it's much more obvious that you've got the one cystic area of the ovary there, and then you've got the other cystic area there. Difficult to say if this is definitely an ovarian cyst, this may be more of a fimbrial cyst, um, but it's they're so close together, it does look like there is some connection here, um, so difficult to say exactly, but you can see why it's got that septum and it's that dividing line between those two um, structures, that dividing membrane. So how do we manage them? What do we do? We're talking exclusively here at the moment about pre-menopausal simple cysts. So these are cysts in people that have not been through the menopause that ovulate. Um, they're really common. So if you scanned everybody, about 4% of women would have a cyst of more than 30 millimetres. 10% will be non-ovarian. So it's not always easy to tell on ultrasound, but sometimes they can either be a, a part of the peritoneum, what we call a peritoneal inclusion cyst, or paratubal, so attached to the tube. Um, if you're premenopausal and if it looks, looks simple, they're a very, very low risk of cancer. So 0.1 to 0.3% risk of cancer, which is quite reassuring to tell patients. We only define them as a cyst if they're more than 30 millimetres. So it's less than 30 millimetres, you would define it as a follicle. And that's because as we've shown with those previous slides, the ovary is an active tissue. It develops these follicles, they rupture, they ovulate and they go away again. Um, so less than 30 millimetres, we wouldn't call them a cyst. Between 30 and 50, it's quite likely that it's again still physiological, what we would call a functional cyst, part of the normal ovarian function, and quite likely to go away when that cycle has resolved. Once they start to get a bit bigger, so if you're talking more 50 to 70, we should really be keeping an eye on these ones. So you would recommend a yearly ultrasound if it was persistent or if they had symptoms or if it was growing, then you would give the option of surgery. If it's more than 70, then we really should be considering surgery, and that's because of the, the risk of torsion, so the risk of the cyst twisting around. So the decision for whether to go ahead for surgery is, is quite difficult, it's quite individualised. So if somebody had um, severe symptoms, if they had lots of pain, if it was, uh, you know, we were worried about torsion, then absolutely they need to undergo surgery. If they wanted to retain their fertility, um, you would need to have a, a sort of careful balance. So any ovarian surgery reduces the ovarian reserve. So the eggs um, are all more or less centered on the outside of the, the sort of capsule of the ovary. And all of our surgery is going to cause damage. So wherever you're doing cutting, diathermy, stripping away the um, ovarian cyst capsule, you're going to damage and lose some eggs and reduce what we call their ovarian reserve. So the ability of that ovary to ovulate. Um, they may have additional surgical or anaesthetic complexity. So if they had lots of medical comorbidities, if they were very obese, if they'd had lots of previous surgery, the chance of them having a complication would be higher. So you may actually, again, have to weigh up how, you know, how their symptoms are and what they want to do. And then there's also, you know, that element of patient choice. The patient may prefer just to come back for a scan once a year and keep an eye on things if it's not bothering them they may choose to avoid that risk of surgery, especially if you've got a simple cyst in somebody who's premenopausal, because it's very unlikely to be anything nasty or cancerous, so they may opt just to have that follow-up. We don't recommend draining them, they tend just to refill. Um, there's a really high recurrence rate, so unless there was a particular, you know, if you really didn't want to operate on them and they were terribly symptomatic, then occasionally we would drain them, but it's not commonly done. Um, the role of the combined oral contraceptive pill is in preventing recurrent cysts. So it won't help if they've already got a cyst, it's not going to help that cyst go away. But if you've got somebody who's coming back every few months, you know, with a cyst of four to five centimetres or symptoms or whatever, it may, there may be a role for giving them the combined oral contraceptive pill.
So other things that cysts can undergo, so you might have heard this term of cyst accident. So it just means that, you know, they either bled into the cyst or it's ruptured or something's happened. So these are examples of hemorrhagic cysts. And that's where you've had a simple cyst or a corpus luteum or a follicle that has undergone bleeding. So they've bled into the cyst and you can see immediately that it's got this, this what they call a reticular pattern. So these grey lines, these mixed appearance. And that's where the, they've bled into the cyst and then that blood has clotted. So um, it gives a particular appearance. If you were to have a look at them at laparoscopic surgery, they often look quite dark. So you might see a much darker kind of purplish colour. And that's because it's not just filled with simple fluid. It's actually full of, of blood and clots. And they can rupture, they can burst. And you can see here that there's been a, a cyst that's burst and it's got active, active bleeding causing hemoperitoneum. So these are things that you would need to, to manage. You couldn't leave that one. So with hemorrhagic cysts, they're slightly different to a simple cyst because they, they may present with pain because they may have that pain. They've already bled into the cyst. They've had a cyst accident or that cyst may have ruptured. If it's burst, it's going to cause them to have um, intra-abdominal bleeding and be in quite a lot of pain. Ideally, you would manage them conservatively. So if they haven't ruptured, they don't have hemoperitoneum, but you found this hemorrhagic cyst on scan, ideally you want to just leave it to go away on its own. Uh, you may need to exercise a little caution if they had a bleeding disorder if they, or if they were on medication um, like anticoagulants. The reason we don't want to operate on them necessarily is because there's a much higher risk of bleeding. The cyst um, is going to be really friable. Every time you touch it, it's going to bleed. It's going to be much more difficult to do the surgery. So they've got a chance of um, losing more blood. They've got a higher chance of then losing ovarian reserve and reducing their fertility because you may end up having to burn more of the cyst capsule to stop it from bleeding. And in some cases where we can't stop the bleeding from the ovary, your only choice is to then remove the whole ovary to stop bleeding, which is going to, again, have a, have a big impact on their fertility. So with a hemorrhagic cyst and surgery, there is an increased chance of needing to do an oophorectomy, removing the whole ovary. They're also more likely to resolve if they've undergone bleeding. There's evidence that it's an active process, so they are more likely to resolve. So you would offer a rescan in three to four months to see if it's gone away, and a lot of them will do. Just a word of caution that they can you can have bleeding into a cyst because it's torted. So if it twists round and then you've got the arterial flow that's still going in, but a reduction in the venous return. So you've got blood going in, but not coming out. You've got an increased risk of those blood vessels bursting and then having a hemorrhagic cyst. So you do not infrequently see a, um, a torsion with a hemorrhagic cyst. So moving on to another really common type of ovarian cyst, we've got an endometrioma here. So this is a cyst formed of endometriosis on the ovary. So endometriosis is the lining of the womb um, where it's found in the wrong place. So commonly on the ovary, in and around the outside of the uterus, on the um, pouch of Douglas, on the uterosacral ligaments. So it can form a cyst on the ovary and it looks really typical. So this is what they call a ground glass appearance. So it just means, I, think I had to look it up, it's like frosted glass essentially. So very uniform, very grey, very sort of flat and boring looking. And that's classic for endometriosis. They can also appear, um, if they've had undergone bleeding, you can also look a bit more like a hemorrhagic cyst. So it can be slightly difficult to tell the difference between an endometrioma and a hemorrhagic cyst. The red arrow here is pointing to this crescent of normal tissue. So you've got the normal ovarian tissue stretched around the outside of the cyst. Um, and you tend to only see this with benign pathology. So it's a really reassuring sign if you see it. Um, it's also more likely to be ovarian rather than paratubal or something else going on. So this is showing you that normal rim of ovarian tissue. Uh, unfortunately, they can still cause problems, so they can rupture. It's a lot less common, um, but this was the patient I saw who had um, incredible pain and actually had a ruptured endometrioma. And what this is showing, you can see all of this brown. So the other previous rupture was very red. It was just clearly fresh blood. But all of this brown material, um, it just looks like liquid chocolate. And that's what um, another name for an endometrioma is a chocolate cyst, because that's that's just the appearance that it has. And this is uh, very, very irritating um, if it ruptures, causes an awful lot of pain. <laughs> 
So they're less likely, um, endometriomas are less likely to undergo a torsion or a rupture. They're often associated with adhesions, so things stuck together caused by endometriosis, which means they're less likely to twist round on their own. If they do rupture, the contents are really, really irritating and it can cause severe pain and even peritonitis. Um, if the endometrioma measures less than 30 millimetres, you can treat it as you would treat anybody with endometriosis. So that's with hormonal suppression, either using the combined oral contraceptive pill, the progesterone only pill, a Mirena coil or um, GNRH analogues. So something to suppress the ovulatory cycle and suppress that tissue. If they're more than 30 millimetres, the Royal College guidelines suggest that you should do surgical management just to confirm the histology. So although they're usually benign, um, they do have that, you know, they're not clearly a simple cyst filled with fluids. So if they are bigger, they do suggest surgical management and getting histology. If your patient's trying to get pregnant, um, they may actually prefer to undergo surgical management because it's uh, recommended to improve their fertility. And with an endometrioma, again, you don't want to just drain it. You want to actually kind of try and remove the lining of the cyst. So if you just drain them, you've still got that um, endometrial tissue that's there and it'll just collect again. So you need to actually strip out the cyst capsule to stop them from reforming. So another um, common cyst is something called a dermoid cyst. So technically they're called uh, mature cystic uh, teratomas, but a dermoid cyst is where you've got lots of confused disordered cell growth so um, they are often contain hair and fat and skin sample skin tissues and bone and things like that and they have a really classic appearance on ultrasound so they they have this acoustic shadowing which is what that s is pointing at and then those white arrows are they're actually strands of hair that cause this increased shadowing and echogenicity there so these are all more pictures of the of dermoid cysts. So again, they're, they're smooth, they're round, they've got mixed contents and they tend to, to cast shadows behind them. So they just look like um, just very large cysts. It's not always obvious when you see them laparoscopically um, what they are. You can't always tell just by looking. But generally, if you accidentally rupture them, you get all of this very yellow, fatty, you know, hair like and contents that comes out. So this is what they look like. This is one that's been cut in half um, in the lab. So you can see that you've got what looks like some cartilage, some fat tissue, some skin cells and then actual hair growth. And it can be um, just like an astounding amount of hair that comes out of these things. They can grow really large as well. They can be easily, you know, 20, 30 centimetres big. So for a dermoid cyst, the management, um, the, the the ultrasound appearances are really classic. So most of these are picked up um, on ultrasound and they um, have that classic appearance. They're usually correctly diagnosed on scan. They're not functional cysts. They don't um, come and go. They're not part of ovulation. They've actually developed from birth due to the aberrant cell differentiation. So the cells have got confused rather than um, turning themselves into ovarian cells. They've got confused and turned themselves into whatever. So, you know, hair, skin, um, bone, etc. They're almost always benign, but there is a 0.2 to 2% risk of malignant transformation. So they're, the reason they're called mature is because the, um, they've reached the end stage. So they're a correct normal skin cell just in the wrong place. If you get an immature one, it's where the, they haven't correctly differentiated to a, a cell type. So they can then keep dividing and dividing and dividing and, and become malignant, so cancerous. Between 10 and 15% are bilateral. So it's always worth having a, a close look at the other side. And they're not going to go away. Um, you can imagine that that hair is not going anywhere. That bit of bone that's in there is not going anywhere. So they often grow very, very slowly, but they they won't go away. And there is a good risk of torsion. So we would counsel people that there's about a 10% risk of a torsion with a dermoid cyst, depending on the size. So you would want to warn that patient. What are the warning signs for torsion? And we'll come on to that a little bit later. Um, rupture is much less common, so they tend to be quite thick walled and they grow very, very slowly. So it's less common for a dermoid cyst to rupture. Um, but if it does, the it's very, very, again, very irritant, the lining, and it can cause quite a nasty chemical peritonitis. So we would usually advise surgery for a dermoid cyst. We know that they're not going to go away. We know that they're probably going to grow slowly. Um, if you think that dermoid has undergone torsion and twisted, then it's emergency surgery. That's the end of it.
if they're very, very small, so if we've picked up a one or two centimetre dermoid, they can be really difficult to excise from the ovary. You can't always see them um, when you're operating and you may end up damaging the ovary as you try to kind of open the ovary almost in half to look for this cyst. So if you've got a very small asymptomatic dermoid, the patient may want to complete their family first before undergoing any surgery. Ideally, we want to manage these laparoscopically, so keyhole, just because the recovery is a lot better, but we do want to avoid spilling the contents. So sometimes you end up doing most of the surgery laparoscopically and then doing what's called a mini laparotomy, so a little cut at the skin to help you get that cyst out whole without rupturing it. If the family is complete, if they definitely don't want any more children or if they're already postmenopausal, you could offer just to remove the whole ovary and the tube to reduce the risk of, um, of rupturing the cyst and causing peritonitis. So it's worth just tailoring to that individual patient. And if you remove them completely, they won't recur. They're not going to come back. So that will be their treatment done. So I keep mentioning it, but we're going to talk about it specifically now. So um, ovarian torsion um, is when the ovary twists round or the cyst on the ovary twists round or whatever the tube twists round. So here um, it's not the easiest to see. So this is actually a pregnancy. So this is a uterus, a pregnant uterus. Um, and here the ovary is located on top of the uterus. And you, if you remember from all of our other images, the ovaries are always dangling down away from the uterus. But here we've quite clearly got a displaced ovary. So it's it's twisted round and ended up on top of the broad ligament and on top. So that's a warning sign already for torsion. Um, classically, they described a whirlpool sign. So this sort of, as it twists round, you get all of the engorged blood flow twisting up together. And then you can see this on scan. And again, this patient's pregnant. You can see this is just a, a little fetus here. Um, so when you take them to theatre, because that's the only way to manage these, um, what you'll see is these this obvious twisted tissue. So you can see that it's discoloured. So the image on the left here with the torsion, you can see these loops where it's it's twisted round on itself. It's gone very sort of purpley grey. It doesn't look terribly healthy. And even extending out here into the side wall, you can see this engorgement where um, the colours changed. So here they've untwisted it. And then you can see it's actually pinked up quite nicely. So where you've gone from this very engorged, swollen tube and ovary, now it's nice and bright pink. So once you've untwisted it, that's what you're looking for. Is, is the blood flow going to come back? So um, it, if you've got an ovarian cyst more than five centimetres, there's about a 10 percent risk of torsion whilst that cyst is there. So it's really important to let women, if you've diagnosed them with a cyst and you're not managing it immediately, to let them know that this is a risk and if they experience the symptoms they need to come back in straight away and tell everybody that they've got a cyst. It's quite rare for ovaries without cysts to undergo torsion so if they have to have be you know something to twist around and then not be able to twist back. So ovaries that are small and normal size that are attached along their long border it's unusual for them to undergo torsion. It can happen particularly in um, in young children and in um, sort of you know people before they've started their periods. It's, it's really difficult to diagnose, it's not easy, um, so it's hard to rule it out and it's hard to rule it in because there's a hugely wide differential diagnosis, so people that turn up with severe lower abdominal pain and then you find a cyst and you think well is it torted or do they just have pain from the cyst or have they bled into it or have they bled into the cyst because it's torted, so it's not easy. Um, the signs that you can see are tachycardia, often due to the pain. They can get a mild pyrexia if they've got this, you know, this tissue that doesn't have a good blood supply, they can start to get a pyrexia. They usually have nausea and vomiting and in about half of cases they'll also have raised white blood cell count. So the criteria, this is taken from the um, TOG article that I mentioned, are if they've got a unilateral lumbar, so lower back or abdominal pain, the odds ratio is four. The pain's been there for more than eight hours. They've got an odds ratio of eight. The vomiting, again, about eight. If the ab absence of um, leukorrhea and metarrhagia, so this is they, they do not have abnormal discharge and they do not have abnormal bleeding. And that's because if you have discharge and bleeding, you're probably more likely to have PID 
or to have some other pathology. So it's the absence, the lack of vaginal discharge and the lack of unusual bleeding that is that gives you the adjusted odds ratio of 12. And then having an ovarian cyst more than five centimetres, as we said, that's a, another risk. So 10 percent chance there. So what are you going to do? I keep mentioning it, but it's emergency. It's emergency surgery to correct the torsion. Otherwise, you've got a risk of losing that ovary um, or that tube to ischemia. So it's usually that they both taut, so they often sort of wrap around each other and around the broad, the round, the round ligament. Sorry. So normally it's the tube and the ovary that are damaged. If you've had symptoms or it's been there more than 48 hours, you've got a lot less chance of a successful reperfusion and function. So it is, although we like to compare it, it is different to testicular torsion, where I think they have a more like a six hour window. Um, however, the earlier you get in and the earlier you reperfuse that, it's going to have a better chance. So particularly if they've got fertility desired, if they want to have children in the future, you need to untwist that and then try and remove the cause. So if there's a cyst there, you can try and remove that cyst so that it's unlikely to twist back and then wait and see if it reperfuses. So see if that blood flow comes back. If they're not bothered about fertility, if they're postmenopausal or if they've um, finished their family, then you can just remove that tube in the ovary. So you don't you wouldn't want to leave the risk of this happening again. So you would um, offer to remove the tube in the ovary. There's some um, advocates for waiting two to three weeks. So just untwisting it, letting it reperfuse and then going back in two to three, two to three weeks later and removing the cyst. And part of the reason for that is if you've had a very engorged cyst or a cyst that's um, undergone hemorrhage, you're going to have a higher chance of damaging it and needing to, to remove it. So the tissues will be less friable if you wait a couple of weeks. If you've had torsion of a normal ovary, um, there's not a lot you can do to prevent it happening because there's no cyst to remove. There is a role for fixing the ovary to the uterus, so suturing the ovary in place so that it doesn't happen again. Um, and that's something that you would consider in, in uh, younger women and children if they've had a, an ovary that's torted. So moving on now away from ovarian things, and so these are para-ovarian or fimbrial cysts. Um, so these form usually from the end of the tube or from next to the ovary, but actually not from the ovary itself. So this is a, a slightly grainy scan, but you can see you've got this cystic area. There's a, a sort of idea of, I think, probably a septum here and then the ovary next to it. And then the same patient that's undergone surgery. So you can see they've got the right ovary, which has got normal looking follicles, but then this cyst attached to the tube. So this is a cyst arising from the, the tube itself, a para ovarian. Um, it's really, really common. So you see it so often, almost every time um, you do a scope and they're usually tiny. So it's kind of, you know, 0.5 centimetres, one centimetre. We see them all the time on scan. Um, and when we're doing scopes, they're not not always a problem. They're not functional, however, so they're unlikely to resolve unless they undergo a rupture. So they're not going to they'll they'll be persistent. They're not going to go away. How you would manage it depends on the symptoms. So they can because they can undergo torsion, they can rupture. Um, hemorrhage is less common, but they, if they're causing pain and if they're, you know, persistently being a nuisance, then you can um, offer to remove them. So coming, staying with the tube now, um, this is a hydrosalpinx, so fluid filled tube. So you can see it looks quite different to the ovarian cyst that we've been looking at. So the tubes are, you know, long snake like structures and here you might initially think all oh, these are septums dividing membranes, but actually you can see the septum incompletely divides. It doesn't go all the way across. And what these actually represent are folds in the tube where the tubes got tortuous. It's sort of kinked and bent because it's so filled with fluid. So you have these incomplete septum here or this snake like appearance where you can actually see it's just you know, coiling on itself. And this is what they look like um, laparoscopically. So normal tube here, this, uh, sorry, normal ovary here, but you can see the tube is not normal. Um, it's very, very swollen. What we call sometimes are these, uh, the sort of like blunted ends. So where the, instead of being finger-like projections, they're very clubbed, they look very rounded. And that's um, as a result of tubal damage. 
So they normally come from having a PID infection, so chlamydia, gonorrhea. This is why um, chlamydia causes infertility, because it damages the tubes. <clears throat> it damages the little um, cilia, the hair cells that waft the eggs along and also waft the fluid along. So you get this, this toxic buildup of fluid within the tubes. Um, they, so that's how they cause infertility and they're also a risk factor for ectopic pregnancy. Um, so it's quite normal for sperm to fertilise eggs within the fallopian tubes and then those cilia, those little hair cells, waft that in, uh, fertilised egg along into the uterus. But if you've got um, damaged tubes, it's more likely to lodge within the tube. So if you think we've picked up a hydrosalpinx, it's really important to screen them and treat them for infection and including their partners. So we can't do this as well as a GUM clinic so you need to refer them to the local GUM clinic to have um, proper screening, partner tracing and also a test of cure so once you've given them the antibiotics has that actually cleared it up because there is increasing drug resistance with chlamydia and gonorrhea. So when would we consider surgery? If they were un acutely unwell with PID and we found the hydrosalpinx we might think that needs to be removed. If they've got chronic symptoms of, of pain, discomfort and sometimes if they're planning IVF, so the fluid that's built up within these tubes is quite embryo toxic. So often um, we'll, not, we'll get referrals from the IVF unit saying either can you remove this tube or can you clip it? Like as if you were doing a, um, a sterilisation procedure, we put filshy clips on. And that's to stop that toxic fluid from getting into the uterus and damaging the embryos put there from IVF. So it's quite a big decision because you're essentially saying that you're, you know, will not have, you'll have no chance of spontaneous conception. But if people are already undergoing IVF, that's something that they may consider. So often the surgery is to just remove the tube. Um, occasionally they'll suture the end open. So it's called a cuff salpingostomy where you open up the end to allow that fluid to drain and try to keep it open. But you have to give quite careful patient counselling because there's still a significant risk of an ectopic pregnancy if they are to conceive. But if someone wasn't eligible for IVF or that wasn't accessible to them, they may, may be willing to take that chance. Um, drainage is completely ineffective. It usually just refills within days. So we don't offer drainage for hydrosalpinx. So one of the complications you can get from hydrosalpinx is a full tubo ovarian abscess. So this is where you've got a collection of pus uh, that's infected the ovary and the tube. So you can see here it's enlarged, it's mixed. You've got these this sort of nasty, lumpy looking tissue and all different uh, areas. And that's probably because you've got some pus, some inflammation. And this is what they look like. So you can see here the anatomy is really distorted. So you've got the uterus here. These are adhesions, these band like adhesions where things have been inflamed. They've got stuck together. The bowel is stuck to the back here. You can't even see the ovary and the tube on this side. They're completely buried. And then this right tube, that's a <laughs> hydrosalpinx here as well. This is an image taken of the liver. So this is uh, Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome where you get these, they're called violin string uh, perihepatic adhesions. So you've got adhesions between the liver and the anterior abdominal wall. And this usually occurs with chlamydia and gonorrhea. So one of the reasons that's why we do our, you know, our 360 sweep is to look for these. And this was a patient that had had a confirmed chlamydia infection. So with a tube ovarian abscess, the management um, depends really on, on how unwell they are. So it's by definition, if you've got a tube ovarian abscess, you've got severe PID. Um, so with severe PID, about 15 to 35 percent go on to develop these abscesses. It's more likely in the 40s and 50s age group. So you get PID in much younger women, often in their late teens, early 20s. You see quite a lot of PID, but actually it's the PID in the 40s to 50s that tend to get the tube ovarian abscesses. The risk factors are the same. So, you know, recent surgery, um, unprotected sexual intercourse, coils, things like that. They can often, quite often, be caused by non-sexually transmitted infections. So um, that's why it's really important to get your micro and to do your cultures, because quite often we'll find they're caused by pathogens that aren't, you know, sexually transmitted. So you may have somebody who's in their 40s, um, you know, married long term same um, relationship no new partners it doesn't mean that their partner's being unfaithful it can be caused by all sorts of bacteria so although we should screen them um, it's worth not jumping to conclusions try not to make them too alarmed having said that we should always screen for stis because you just never know referring to the genital urinary medicine because they can do partner screening and they can also do the test of cure as we've mentioned 
it's really rare to get this in postmenopausal women. So it's generally something we see premenopausally. If you find it in a postmenopausal woman, have a very high suspicion of cancer because 45% of those patients will have a coexisting malignancy that's caused them to get this um, tube ovarian abscess. So that's a worrying situation, somebody postmenopausal with a tube ovarian abscess. So medical management will be successful for about 70% of patients, um, but there's a higher rate of recurrence if you treat it medically rather than surgically. So for the medical treatment, you'd want to remove if they had a coil in, so an IUD or an IUS, you need to remove it. Always, always ask um, whether they've had other otherwise unprotected sexual intercourse in the last seven days because there's a risk of pregnancy and you may need to give them um, additional contraception. So you treat them with IV antibiotics. If that wasn't settling them down, if that didn't work, it's worth getting a, a CT to think about. Is there something we can drain radiologically? If we can't drain it radiologically or if they're still not improving, then we need to look at surgical management. Um, they do have quite poor prognosis if they're bigger than five centimetres. And certainly if they're bigger than eight centimetres, they're, they're very likely to end up needing surgery. Other poor prognostic factors are being over 40, smoking, and then higher white cells at presentation. And if this is a chronic abscess, so somebody that's, you know, failed medical management already. Um, if you do medically manage someone, they need a follow up scan. So you want to make sure that it's getting better. Otherwise, they can sort of rumble on and flare up and they'll end up coming back in. So you need to make sure that they put a follow up ultrasound, uh, ultrasound after discharge. So this isn't hopefully something that we see very often, but I think it's important just to have an awareness of how um, cancerous malignant ovarian cysts can present. So compared to all the other images we've looked at, I mean, these look nasty you can see there's increased blood flow there's these thick septa they look um, unusual there's sort of lots of different types of tissue so these all look quite worrying they've got solid areas and solid areas with blood flow um, you, you'll almost never see this um, but this is what a metastatic ovarian cancer would look like so you've got all of these deposits, these extra growths, papillary projections um, all over the place and this that increased blood supply that you're seeing. But it's un very unusual to see this because the we don't do surgical management for advanced metastatic ovarian cancer. So there's something called the IOTA rules and we don't necessarily use them um, in the way they're intended for diagnosing, but they, they're useful to bear in mind. And if you hear about the, the terminology, they should be ringing bells and thinking, well, maybe this isn't quite normal. So if you've got benign, so benign features are these B sides. So the benign features are a unilocular. So no other locules, just one simple cyst. If it does have solid components, but these are very, very tiny solid components, that's likely to be benign. If it casts a shadow, so if when you're scanning, there's a big shadow behind the cyst, that's actually a benign feature, a, a good sign. And if it's very, very smooth and less than uh, 100 millimetres, so less than 10 centimetres, again, that sort of smooth outline, it's unlikely uh, to be cancer. And if there's no blood flow, so it just is a simple collection of fluid without any additional blood flow. So then conversely, you've got the, the worrying features, the M features, malignant features. So an irregular solid tumour. If you've got ascites, so lots of fluid, um, everything's sort of floating around, if you've got ascites. Four papillary structures. So these are things that project into the cyst. You've got solid parts within it um, and it's multilocular. So lots of different pockets, bits that are solid and it's more than than 10 centimetres. That's worrying. And if you've got a very high um, blood flow, so anything with cancer generally gets a, a much higher blood flow as it needs that, that blood to grow. Um, so because of that risk of malignancy, we manage postmenopausal simple cysts differently. Um, so these are people that have been through the menopause, generally over 50, but there are women that will have a, a premature menopause. It's always worth bearing that in mind. They're common postmenopausal cysts. So it's about five to 17 percent of women um, in the postmenopausal state will have a cyst. And that's because we consider anything over 10 millimetres a cyst. And that's because the ovaries are not active. They're not ovulating. They shouldn't have follicles. So anything more than 10 millimetres in the postmenopausal women should be considered a cyst. The majority are still benign, but because there's a higher risk of cancer, we manage them differently. 
if you've got a simple cyst, so again, round, just that black fluid, there's nothing in it and it's got a thin wall, we can be reassured that between 95 and 99% of those will be benign. However, they've still got all the normal risks of torsion, rupture, hemorrhage. But we would go on, if it wasn't an emergency, we would go on to take tumour markers and then that would guide our management and help us decide what we're going to do. So regardless of whether we think this is cancer or not, if you've got a suspected torsion or a confirmed torsion, they need surgery. If we're not dealing with an emergency, then we're going to look at a combination of things. So we're going to look at the CA125, which is our tumour marker of choice in ovarian cancer. We're going to look at the ultrasound and then the menopause status and we calculate the risk of malignancy index. That'll either give us a high risk score or a low risk score. If we think there's a high risk of malignancy, they go to MDT and they're treated by the gynae oncology team. If it's a low risk, then we would offer treatment by the general gynecology team. However, um, all of the histology is always going to be done and checked to see whether that's benign. So we would usually, if postmenopausal women advise to remove the tubes and all of both ovaries and both tubes all at the same time because they don't need them. Um, and if you then do find a cancer, you've at least removed the whole thing. You've not tried to do a cystectomy. If we think they're really high risk, we would often do a more extensive surgery. So perform a hysterectomy at the same time and sample the omentum as well. Take peritoneal washings and look for any cancer cells. So moving on now, just a couple of other weird and wonderful things that you find. Um, these are pedunculated fibroids. So they're not technically a nexal pathology because they're from the uterus. But when you scan, you can see that this fibroid would appear to be near the tube and, and near the ovary. So a pedunculated fibroid is often quite a good mimic of other things. And we've had a couple where we've mistaken them for ectopic pregnancies and people have undergone, undergone laparoscopic surgery. And then you found this little fibroid sitting there looking like an ectopic. And the other thing worth bearing in mind is that, um, I don't know if you remember as medical students, or having to learn all the different possible positions of the appendix, and uh, you can get a pelvic appendix. So this is the um, cecum here, and this is the appendix just sitting right next to the ovary and the tube. So always worth bearing in mind that some masses or um, things that look like tubular renal cysts could actually be the appendix and that management is refer surgeons. So in summary, it's important to relate your scan findings to the whole clinical picture. Um, these, there's, most of the symptoms here are going to be broadly similar, so lower abdominal pain. Um, cysts are often incidental findings and they may not actually be the cause of the pain. So it's always worth having a think, could this be PID? Is this something I need to screen and treat with antibiotics? You can't necessarily diagnose torsion or um, rule it out on an ultrasound scan. And torsion is an emergency, so we need to take it seriously if, we, if that's what we think it is. Premenopausal and postmenopausal patients with ovarian cysts or adnexal pathology require completely different management. So don't lump them in together. Think about it um, and the management should differ according to the, the patient um, needs. It's always worth trying to work out how can you sensitively make an inquiry about someone's plans for fertility, whether they want children. Um, because it will guide your management. You, you know, if somebody's definitely, absolutely, certainly completed their family, do you really want to be, you know, hacking about trying to take a cyst out for hours when you could actually just remove the whole ovary and they'll be perfectly happy with that? So it's something that we should get better at asking, but in a sensitive way. And then always think about, do we need to do that follow up scan? Does this patient need another appointment? So, you know, you've diagnosed the hydrocelpinx, so you've screened them, given them some antibiotics and sent them away. But do they need follow up? Or if you found, uh, you know, two centimetre hemorrhagic cyst, that probably doesn't need follow up. So referring them for a scan is a waste. So try to just be careful with our resources about who we follow up. So the management guidelines, if anyone's interested in reading in a little bit more detail, there's, uh, these are both open access, the Royal College guidelines on premenopausal and postmenopausal ovarian cyst management. We've got the endometriosis guideline, which is enormous, um, but you can skip to various sections depending on what you wanted to read. And then the TOG articles on tuber ovarian abscess and torsion. So these are available to anybody that pays their Royal College fees. Um, but I'm happy to print out a couple of copies if anyone wanted to read those because uh, they're, they're really I found them really good, really helpful articles.
So these are the, the multiple references of where I got the various um, scan images and the ultrasound images, if anyone wanted to, to just go back and read a little bit more about those. Um, and thank you to all the people that put these out there because they're really useful resources. And I hope that was helpful. Um, so as ever, you can just scan the QR code. The feedback's really useful, so I know what uh, what works well, what doesn't work well, what's useful. Um, and it helps me guide what I'll do the next few talks on. Um, so if you've got a few minutes, that would be super helpful. Thank you.